expect uh, a listing of uh, everything that uh, God provided to us uh, and uh, gave us. And uh, at the end, a uh, nice big thank you, right? Which is essentially what we are doing after the song, Dayenu. That we're saying, uh, for sure, after he did all of that, he gave us all of those things and, you know. But the beginning of it, the, 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 the beginning section is, is sort of odd. Because it says, uh, we, we're sort of saying, if God would just take us out of Mitzrayim and did nothing else, it's enough. When did you ever hear... <laughs> Of, 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 of uh, you know, anybody saying enough. You know, we always want more or more and more and more. So, uh, and, and, and especially after he gave it to us. So what, what, what does it mean enough? This, the whole concept of it's enough is very, very odd. And it continues, you know, each and every, each and everything. If he didn't do uh, the judgment, it didn't uh, destroy the idols, you know, he, etc etc all is enough is enough so what does this enough wh why is it so that's that's essentially what we're going to try to figure out today so um do you have the source sheet which uh, came with the email yes you do fantastic yes so Let's uh, let's go to source number one, and uh, it's from the Talmud, from Nazir, from the Tractate of Nazir, and um, we will learn something that seemingly uh, looked totally <laughs> off, uh, not connected, but uh, it will connect very nicely at the end. So, the Tractate of Nazir is dealing with a Nazarite, right? Someone who's uh, Who's uh, stating that they are going to be a, a, a Nazareth or a Nazareth, Nazareth, me meaning uh, he's going to grow his hair and not drink wine, etc. So Misha Amar, Hareini Nazir, Veshama Chavero, Veamar Veani, Veani Kula Nazirim. So uh, the rule is that a person, in order to become a Nazir, just has to say, I am Nazir. And with that, he is becoming a Nazir. This strength of a, of a person's uh, commitment by saying it, by, by stating the commitment verbally, is, uh, exists in many other sections. Also, uh, when someone is doing, uh, is, is doing a neder, a vow, or someone is, is uh, uh, a swearing, a shvua, all of those uh, all of those uh, things are, it's enough that the person is talking and saying that I shall be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a vow that I'm not going to eat uh, whatever, uh, uh, chocolate uh, too much. <laughs> you know, so that's, uh, we have the strength to do it. Now, you don't need uh, witnesses, you don't, you don't need to lift anything, you don't need to buy anything. It's, it's, a, it's a special... Uh, special type of a, of a uh, arrangement. Now, what happens if I say, uh, if one person says, if, uh, if Ruven says, I'm a Nazir, and then his Shimon, his friend, is sitting right there and hears that Ruven is saying, I'm a Nazir, and he's saying, me too, and me too, and I. And um, then there is another one who hears Ruven, uh, Shimon says it and says, Levi is saying, it's all, uh, me too. So the Mishnah is telling us that they're all becoming Nazirs. They're all, it's obligating them all. And it's very similar to Shavuah, and it's very similar to a vow as well. If someone says, I'm, I shall not eat chocolate anymore, and someone says, me too. They are, so you also don't eat chocolate, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a vow that uh, obligates you as, as much as the other. Um, so that's the basic rule. Now, what happens, we know that in a vow and in a, in, in a situation of a Nazir, there is a way out. If someone goes to a, uh, to a Rav 
and tell them, you know, I, I, I really, I said that I'm going to be a Nazir, but I didn't realize that my wife is going to hate it so much that she would want to divorce me. So the Rav says, oh, no, if, if, if that's so, so you didn't mean it, so you, your mind was not totally uh, calculating all the implications, and you have unintended consequences, so you are, it's out, you know. So he gives the, the, the Rav as the, the power, and it's not exactly that. You have to really go to, to a Rav and have the Rav do it. You cannot uh, think to yourself, oh, you know what, I didn't mean it. That doesn't work. So what happened if the first one reconsidered, went to the Rav, got the Heter, and uh, so he is no longer an Azir. What happened to the second one? The second one based his Nazirut, his being an Azir, or his vow. He based it on the first one. The first one is no longer obligated because he went and got, a, 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 got a nullification. What happened to the second one? The Mishnah says the second one is also uh, allow uh, you know an old his his uh, nazirut or his vow is also an old because it's based only solely on the first one and the first one is gone like the the took the carpet out of someone you know and uh, took the, the took the floor out of someone so the second one is also not uh, obligated now if the the last one is saying it uh, if the last one is going to the rav and get it an old only the last one is is uh, getting the the break but not the, the ones before him. That is the basic, um, that's the basic halacha in the Zirut. And um, it's, it's uh, again, it's in not only in the Zirut, it's in also in all of the other uh, mitzvot that has to do with somebody uttering a, a statement and obligating themselves, like in a vow and a, and a shvua. And it's called matpis, like, you hanging on to, you latching on to, matpis, litfos from the word in Hebrew, litfos to catch. Now, what, so, so, um, so we saw that uh, matpis to catch is holding on to someone as long as the first one is still uh, active, is still in effect then the one who's catching, the one who's holding on to, is also in effect, otherwise it's not. Okay, let's let that hang for a second. Let's put that aside for a second and go to a totally different, uh, what seemingly is a totally different subject. So the story goes, um, and we're going to, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we read it in the beginning of uh, Sefer Shmot, that Moshe, um, was uh, uh, saw that uh, some some uh, uh, um, Egyptian is torturing a Jew. He killed the Egyptian. The next day, he saw two Jews fighting, um, and he told the one, you know, he told them, uh, "Why are you fighting? Why are you hitting the one another?" So they told him, "Ah, you're going to uh, to kill us also, like you killed the. You're going to kill me, like you killed that Egyptian." So he ran away. He ran away. He got to Midian. When he got to Midian, um, as it wa were, was the, 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 the Seder, the, uh, the custom in those days, when you come to a place, you go to the center of town. In the center of town, there was a well. And, in the, and, and around the well, um, you can find, uh, you know, you had merchants, you had, every, you had the, whole, the whole life of the town was around the well. So in the well, he sees um, uh, seven girls who were the daughters of Jethro, um, trying to, uh, uh, to, to um, give a drink to, how do you call it? To, to water, to water the, uh, the, 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 what? The sheep. Yeah, the They're sheep. sheep. Right, exactly. And what happens? The, uh, you had some men around that uh, th thought that they're uh, stronger and they can bully them, and they didn't want to wait in line, so they kicked them out. So Moshe saw it, and he was in, in you know, uh, in, in a mindset of, of uh, doing justice in the world, and we see that uh, one person is hurting another that's not right, and you have to save the, uh, the weak one. He did the same thing, and he saved the, the girls from uh, the daughters of Jethro from those people. So they came home early. Usually it would take them a whole day to, uh, to water the sheep. 
they came home early, so the father says, you know, what's going on? So they said, uh, you know, a man helped us. So he said, so where is he? Well, well, well you know, bring, bring him home. Let's see who he is. He has seven daughters, right? You see an eligible bachelor who has a, a good heart as well. You know, why not? So they brought him in and they gave him food. Jethro gave him food. And then we have the following statement, which is in uh, source number three. Vayoel Moshe lashevet et ha'ish vayiten et zipor habito lemoshe. Vayoel Moshe, Yoel, the word Yoel is strange here because it's like, it seems like extra. It just says, Vayeshev Moshe, right? Moshe um, uh, consented to stay with the man. What do you mean consented? What was the issue here to consent? So, you know, on its surface, uh, you, would, uh, you would think the guy has seven daughters. And uh, he rather have, uh, you know, a daughter down the street than a daughter in Houston, right? So he's, uh, he, he wanted, he saw that the guy is uh, an eligible bachelor. And he wanted to give one of his daughters to that guy. But he didn't want him to take off to Houston. So he said, please um, sit here. And, and uh, so Moshe consented to that idea. And he remained in Midian, and therefore uh, Jethro gave him his daughter Tzipora to, to, to be a wife. Now let's look at Rashi for a second. Let's look at Rashi. And, um, okay, who did that? Um, Let's look at Rashi and um, and say and and see how Rashi explains the word Vayoel. So the first explanation is he says that it's uh, it translates Vayoel like the word Targum, like, like the like Unculus, like the translation to Aramaic. Um, that's the meaning of the word Yoel. What is the translation to Aramaic? The translation to Aramaic is the word Vetsavi. If you have ever had the opportunity of reading a ktuba, you see, you would recognize the word vetsavi. Vetsavi means that I consent, that I, I uh, obligate myself. Um, and, and uh, you know, the man is obligating to take care of his wife. That's the, the word vetsavi. So, um, so that's the first explanation of Rashi. The second explanation, Rashi says... Um, what does he mean? Um, what does he mean? Vayoel. It says leshon umidrasho leshon Allah. Midrasho leshon Allah means it's a it's a curse. It's like it's it's a it's a it's a very strong word that means that I swear, I swear with a curse. You know, if if I don't do it, it's it's like curse on me. That's the type of uh, th that's the type of word it means. Um, he he swore to um, to Jethro that he is not going to leave the country of Midian. That's why Yitro uh, agreed to give him the, his daughter because he really promised him, "I'm not going away." So that's the word Vayoel. Okay. The question is obviously now. We know that Moshe ended up in Mitzrayim. How did it end up in Mitzrayim? He promised Yitro that he's not going to leave town. So how did he end up in Mitzrayim? So the Gemara in Masechet Nedarim is giving an answer, a very simple answer. What's the answer? It says, the Gemara in Nedarim, it says, it's taught in the Brayta, Tanya, someone who is, um, has a, a vow that promised, prohibited himself with a vow to... Um, to and to uh, uh, derive benefit from from another. For example, I say I will never eat in your house. You know, I, I'm never going to enjoy a, a meal in your house. I'm never going to step a foot in your house. So, uh, someone is saying something like that, um, and um, so obviously there are two parties here. There is the person who is um, who is making the vow, and there is the person who is being affected by it. Um, the halakha is that if someone wants to annul it, 
all parties has to be present. So if I come to you and say, I'm never going to enjoy your uh, meal with you, or you're never going to step foot in my house, I'm making a vow of that. Okay? In order to undo it, you have both parties has to be there, and you have to say, listen, I, I, um, I'm asking uh, forgiveness. I didn't mean, I didn't think that it's going to affect our friendship, and you know, and uh, we should uh, we should annul it. So with the, 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 the you go to the rabbi, but both parties, both people, has to be there because you need to nullify it in the face or in the presence of the other party. Now let's go to that vow of Moshe. Moshe made a swore that he is not going to leave town. Fast forward to. Um, when uh, right after the burning bush, he met God at the burning bush, right? And God told him as follows. Uh, he told him that your people in, in Midian uh, uh, are, are in, in Mitzrayim are, are uh, suffering. And he says, He told Moshe in Midian, go back to Egypt. And you don't have to worry about those people who were chasing you or trying to arrest you because you killed that Egyptian, because those people died already. And the question is, why do we say the word Bemidyan? God told Moshe, go back to Mitzrayim because all those people died. Why, do you, why does he have to say, God told Moshe in Midian? Who cares? It seems superfluous. What's this word Bemidyan teaching us? So the rabbis are telling us that it's teaching us that he told, God told Moshe, while you're in Midian, you have to finish the business that you started in Midian. You made a vow, you, made, you swore, you promised something in Midian. You have to take care of that first in Midian, and then you can go back to Mitzrayim because there is no problem in Mitzrayim. The people died already, and you can go. So that is how Moshe Rabbeinu um, got out of the promise that he gave Yitro. He, right before God sent him to go back to, to Egypt, he went back to, to Yitro because he made the vow in his face, right? To, to, in his presence. And in order to undo it, to nullify it, you need to be there together with Jethro. So he could not leave town before meeting Yitro and getting his permission, which he did. And Yitro gave him permission. And that's how we ended up in Mitzrayim. Perfect. All right. Let's that also stand for a second. And we'll connect it all in a, in, in a minute. Let's go now to source number five, the tractate Nedarim. And in that tractate, in that section, in that Mishnah, we are learning um, what is the what are the, the the words because neder is when someone is stating a, a statement that I'm shall do this or I shall not do that. Um, what are the specific the, the language matters so much that the, the the Mishnah is very clear and very exact as to what exactly I'm saying. What is the exact word? What is the exact verb that I'm going to use in order to, uh, uh, to obligate myself to, to do something? So it goes through a whole list. We're not going to read it. It's, it those are words that are similar to, to the, the real word and uh, words that we use at one point of time in certain languages. Not for now. Let's just uh, fast forward to the last few words. Um, it says, if someone no der bemohi arelu kinu English wife, somebody is making a vow in Mohi. What is Mohi? This is a weird word. So Rashi, uh, Rabbeinu Hananel, I'm sorry, Rabbeinu Hananel, uh, Deran, uh, Rabbeinu Nachman, I'm sorry, Rabbeinu Nachman, Deran, which is in source number six. Uh, Deran is saying, Nadar bemohi are elukinuim lishvua. What is Mohi? Mohi says that's Moshe. Mohi is uh, the, the, how you say the, the, the name of Moshe, our Moshe Rabbeinu, um, in the Persian language, in Aramaic, in, in the Aramaic language. 
So Mohi means Moshe. What does, it, what does the Mishnah tell us? The Mishnah is telling us that if someone is saying, I am obligating myself like Moshe Rabbeinu, which is not to leave town, this is an obligation. A person is allowed to say, I am obligating myself in something that's written in the Torah. Something like what Moshe Rabbeinu uh, obligated himself. And the Mishnah is saying that that is a legitimate form of the language, the legitimate form of, of the nether, and it's obligating the person to fulfill that nether. Now let's put it all together. We have a problem here. The problem is that the nether of Moshe was an old. Right? We just learned that Moshe made the nether a promise not to leave Midian. And then he annulled it. That's how he was able to get out of, sea of town and go to Egypt. So, and before we learned that when someone is matpis, someone is latching on to a, uh, a nether, it's, all, it's okay as long as the first one is still active. If the one, the first one who made the nether is inactive already, the one who is latching onto it is also inactive. So Moshe Rabbeinu is uh, 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 neder is an old, so it's inactive, right? And if it's inactive, how can we say that if someone says that I'm I'm I'm, I'm making a neder, I'm latching on to Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, vow is is um, is a legitimate form of making a vow. You can, you can. It doesn't matter. That's what the, the Mishnah is saying. That you can, you don't. The question is, how can you make a vow if it's not here anymore? Not here. Not the person is not here because it's that's that's another question which will be answered as well. But the, the because it's Torah and the Torah is 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 uh, eternal, we are able to do that. You know, that's someone. Someone can say, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm obligating myself like it's written in the Torah. You to stay love? Midian? Not Midian necessarily. To stay where you are. To stay where you are. I'm obligating myself like Moshe Rabbeinu, but in regarding to Livingston, you know? It's a... Uh, so, um, so there is a, 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 an interesting answer, answer by, by the Ragat Shover. And the answer is, basically, that... Even though that for Moshe Rabbeinu, that vow was annulled and it's no longer active, but because this whole story, the vow was stated, was written in the Torah, because it was written in the Torah, the Torah is eternal, and therefore it's still valid. Even though that for Mr. Moshe, at a certain point of time, it was already an old, for us, it's never an old, ever, because it's always active. It's always eternal. Beautiful. Let's go back to Dayenu. Let's go back to Dayenu. When you guys are all, I think, uh, professional, right? You have your doctors and, uh, and you have uh, degrees and you had good jobs, right? So when someone gets his doctorate or becomes a lawyer or an engineer or gets his first job, um, you know, so they're happy, right? It's a, it's a cause for celebration. They, they, they raise a glass and say, L'chaim, thank God, I'm, I achieved my goal. But then what happened the next year? You, you're making a party again because you got your degree and... On the first of Nisan, so you're making every year a party on the first of Nisan? No. You know, you, do you commemorate always the first job and the second job that you have and the promotion that you have? Nobody does that. Why? Because it's not as important anymore. It was just a stepping stone to the next level. It was a stepping stone to go from, you know, where you were before to so to to a, to a higher level. So at the time, 
at the time it was very important and it was worth mentioning. But later on it became not important because you moved on. You have other things in your life, right? You, 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 when you're a doctor, you don't celebrate your, your, your bachelor's degree, you know? And when you're a doctor and you have your practice, you don't celebrate that you got a doctorate. This is very different with Torah. All of the events that occurred to the Jews when we got out of Mitzrayim and when in general everything that's written in the Torah is eternal and is important and is being told to us for a specific reason. So we are obligated as we are living our uh, redemption again from Mitzrayim, we are reliving it every year. We have to relive all the steps in between. All the stepping stones, all the, all the uh, intermediary um, uh, steps that we took and the, the break and, the, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the goodness that God gave us in the middle, they're significant because we're reliving them and they're eternal. So when we say that, uh, you know, uh, God uh, uh, just, uh, where is it? God just uh, uh, destroyed their... Uh, their gods, but uh, they didn't. He didn't destroy their. Uh, um, if God would not destroy their uh, firstborn, it will be enough. We have to live, and we have to th be thankful, and we have to forever eternalize that moment that was right after God destroyed their gods, and right before he destroyed their their uh, their firstborn, and so on and so forth. We have to relive all the steps. It took, it took a long time. Some of it, you know, for 40 years it took some of those steps, right? But we have to relive them every year again and again and again. And at the time, at the time when someone gets his doctorate, wow, they don't, you know, they achieved something. They don't sit right away, or normal people at least, don't sit right away. Okay, what's next? You know, what's the... They, they took a step back. Okay, let me enjoy it. Let me get a cake. Let me say l'chaim. Let me, you know, let me, let me make a party. Let's be in the moment. So we have to be in the moment, thankful and grateful, and and uh, uh, showing um, our gratitude to God every step of the way. So it's enough. We have to live it. Yeah, it's enough. And then we go. We we graduate that level. We go to the next level, and that's enough. So every year when we say dayenu. This is, this is what we need to do. We need to sit there and be in the moment of, okay, we just got the man. All right. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. That, that we got the Shabbat. Wow. That amazing. That, you know? And that's why we're saying it in, in this kind of a language. Now, um, I don't know if, uh, uh, I don't know right now. If there is a second class coming up, is it? Is the second class coming on at uh, eight thirty? I think some somebody's. Anyway, we can we can we can try to go to do another one, very interesting as well, um, and see if, if they're kicking us out. The um, one of the uh, one of the later uh, the later events that uh, we're talking about in Dayenu is uh, if God, um, if God would, uh, if God would, uh, if, if we would, uh, if God would uh, put us uh, right in front of Mount Sinai and didn't give us the Torah, that would be enough, which is strange, you know? So <laughs> what, what, what's the point of standing in front of Har Sinai without getting the Torah, right? Um, so for that, there is also a little bit of, a, of an intro. And again, I hope they're not going to kick us out in the middle. So let's go to uh, uh, source number seven. Uh, source number seven is uh, mentioning the rationale behind the name Mount Sinai. What is Mount Sinai all about? Um, because it was a, a, an unimportant mountain, you know, before Matan Torah, it, it was an unimportant, lowly, no-name type of a mountain, and now 
it became a very important mountain and that the, the whole desert is called the, the, the Sinai Desert after that mountain, right? So what does it mean, the name? So um, one, one rabbi is saying that uh, it means a nest, that uh, Sinai, who is, who is, uh, um, that one, I see, I see some kids coming, uh, do you have a, uh, uh, do you have something now, uh, where is Josh there, is Josh with us? I don't know, anyway, um, so, and I have an end of the like reading for me for you. That's not awkward. Well, it is. It is. It is your group. If if uh, if Josh is coming there. Just two. Well, it's just two more. And one and two. All right. We'll uh, we'll we'll continue a little a little longer. Anyway, so so the name Sinai um, means that uh, is coming from the word sin'ah, from the word, from the word hatred. Um, because, because what happens is, um, see, um, uh, at the moment that we got the Torah, suddenly the entire world started hating us, which is very, very uh, curious and interesting. That's where, that's where it started. People actually started hating the Jewish people um, as soon as we got the Torah in Sinai, that's what the rabbis are telling us. Mount Sinai, because of the Sinai. Um, what? Yeah, it's it start. I'm 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 going to be short because I think there is a, a youth function here. But so the the bottom line is that um, basically we the the distinction between us and the rest of the world was born on Mount Sinai. In front of, before we got the Torah, as we were ready to accept the Torah, this is when our, um, uh, our specialness, our, our uh, part in the world was given to us. Was given to us the, the unity that we exhibited in front of Mount Sinai, the togetherness that we exhibited in front of Mount Sinai, that is a gift that God gave us. That for that, that is part of why the entire world can't stand us, and that is something that we should cherish forever. Not the fact that the world cannot stand us, but the fact that we have this very, very special, uh, very, very special uh, uh, um, unity within us. Anyway, I, I don't want to take away from the youth department. They they set up a, a function for eight thirty. They uh, instead of 8.45. So thank you everybody for the Hasidus and Coffee participants. The bottom line is when we say Dayenu this year, let's remember every step of the way. Let's remember uh, exactly uh, all of the, the, the amazing stuff that was uh, part of our heritage, that is part of our heritage, and we'll take it with, our, with us for, uh, for the following year. Thank you guys. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos, everybody. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.